us today. God, we thank you for your greatness. Thank you for your faithfulness, God. You never fail. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're looking to you today, and we're trusting you to supply needs. You see all the needs uh, in, this, in the class today. You see all those who are watching us today by way of the Internet. Supply these needs. Help them and strengthen them. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read Philippians 4 and 11 as you remain standing. We're going to look at King James Version first, Living Bible, and then Amplified Bible. Philippians 4, 11 from King James. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now notice uh, the Living Bible, New Living Bible. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. And the Amplified Bible, not that I am implying that I was in any personal want, for I have learned how to be content, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or disquieted in whatsoever state I am. We're going to talk to you today about happiness versus contentment. The Lord bless you, and you may be seated. Areas of our world are divided into many different ways. There are seven continents, four hemispheres, east, west, north, south. And naturally, within those general designations, there are many smaller designations, such as countries and states and counties and cities, etc. But today, we would like to focus on two divisions that I suppose sociologists would refer to as city and country, city and country. When our children were small, they had a little video called Country and City Mouse. And uh, it was a cute little video. Two cousins lived in the country. The city mouse or the mouse uh, that uh, decided to go live in the city went and stayed for a while and then decided he would visit his cousin, the country mouse. And what was so cute, the country mouse really had a country twang and the city mouse had more of a city twang, I suppose. And uh, it was a cute little story. I love the city, and I love the country. I have never lived in the country. How many have lived in the country? All right. When I was just a kid, most of my years, my early years, were spent in a small town of 2,500. Skyatook, Oklahoma, 15 miles north of Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I have been used to small towns, but uh, frequently on Sunday I would go out into the country with my friend Bud or Howard, and Bud had some horses. We would ride horses and uh, enjoy the country. I love the country but I love the city as well. You know, people get used to their domain. They get used to where they live. When we pastored in West Texas, Borger, we had a family who uh, decided to go visit some relatives in Arkansas. 
When they got back, they were complaining. They said, oh, my, there were so many trees you couldn't see anything. Well, out in western Oklahoma, we could see Amarillo 47 miles away, the lights of Amarillo when we'd get out on the highway. So you could see for miles. What? Did I say west Oklahoma? West Texas. Okay, I'm sorry. We pastored in Borger, Texas, West Texas. So uh, this family visited, and they said there were just too many trees. Well, what we missed living in Borger, Texas, was the trees. Living down here, I miss Missouri. I miss the trees, not just the trees. We have a lot of trees down here, but I miss the hills and uh, the change of seasons. Well, we all get used to certain things. What's interesting in the Bible, there were city and country folks. For example, John the Baptist was a leather and locust man. He, uh, he lived out on the desert, pretty, pretty rough guy. John the Baptist uh, was not a city guy. In fact, uh, Jesus said, what went ye out for to see? He said, if you went out there expecting to see somebody in nice apparel like they wear in the city or the palace, he said, then you're going to be disappointed because John the Baptist is not that kind of a man. I remember Amos, the prophet, he went from the southern kingdom to the northern kingdom. He was a southerner, and he went north. So he went up in Yankee country, and uh, he began to prophesy against the altar. They told him, they said, go home. Go back south. We don't want you up here. He said, well, wait a minute. God told me to come up here and prophesy. He said, I'm not the son of a prophet. He said, uh, I was a herdsman, in other words, a cowboy. I'm just a cowboy from the south, and uh, in fact, he said, I was a gatherer of sycamore fruit, so he was a fruit picker from the south, and a cowboy, and he went north, and he wasn't welcome. They said, go back home, cowboy. There were feelings between the north and south, even in the Bible days. Peter, James, and John were raw, rough fishermen. That's why Simon Peter, when you read about him, it's, it's, it's so interesting. He's cutting all people's ears. He's giving people a cussing. And he, well, not really giving them a cussing. He just cursed and said he didn't know Jesus. And uh, he's fishing naked, and he's just doing a lot of things that, uh, that I guess... Uh, uh, the country folks might might be more comfortable doing. But he preached a great message on the day of Pentecost after he prayed through. Now, what about city folks? Paul was a, was a city folk. He was probably an attorney. He uh, came up under Gamaliel, a famous lawyer. So, and his writings are kind of like uh, a lawyer at times, especially Romans. Matthew sat at the receipt of customs. So Matthew was a city dude. He was a customs official. Now I'm going to make a statement and don't anybody leave. Hang on because you'll understand. God's people are city folks. God's people are city folks. You see, since man was expelled from the garden, he has not been perfectly happy anywhere. We will not be perfectly happy until we are in what? The city. The heavenly city. The new Jerusalem. That's where we belong. So man is between garden and city. He's between the garden of Eden and between the new Jerusalem. You remember Abraham looked for a city. It didn't say he looked for the country and some place way out in the woods somewhere, he looked for a city. 
So that's why I say believers are city folks. We're not comfortable here. We're headed for heaven. Now, let's really talk about happiness and contentment. Happiness versus contentment. How happy are we supposed to be here? I love the, the statement by E.M. Bounds. I've given it to you before. God has an eternity to make you happy. An eternity to make you happy. But only a lifetime to make you holy. So God would rather that we be holy than happy. Happiness is something that we're going to enjoy up there one of these days, total happiness. So instead of the emphasis being on happy here, it should be on being content. Now, the word content, the word content is from a Latin word, Sententus, which means satisfied. We are to be satisfied. Philippians 4.11 again. Whatsoever state I am, I have learned I have learned to be content. I have learned to be satisfied. To understand this a little better, I would like to give an example of eating. Eating. We go from hungry to satisfied to full. How many times do we sit down to eat a meal and we're enjoying it so much we eat past the satisfied point and we get into the point where we really haven't have had enough but we like to keep going because it tastes so good and we get full and then very, very full and we get uncomfortable. How many times have we all been interrupted? Maybe a phone call or the doorbell would ring. We've been interrupted during a meal. Halfway through the meal, we get interrupted. We get up, and we're gone for 5, 10, 15 minutes. And often, at least it's been my experience, that I could not go back to the table because I had eaten enough to be really satisfied, but if the phone had not rung, I would have stayed there and eaten more. So whatsoever state we are in, we have learned to be, Paul said, he had learned to be content or satisfied. Now, the message today really is this. Make the best of a bad situation or make the best of a situation that's not as good as you would like for it to be. For example, there are some people who are constantly changing jobs because they can't find that perfect job. They can't find that perfect boss, can't find the perfect associates and can't find the perfect salary. Well, guess what? You're never going to be able to find that. What do you have to do? You have to say, I am going to be satisfied. Now, I'm not talking about a horrible situation where you can correct. But there are some things that we cannot change. If we cannot change a bad situation, we need to learn somehow to tolerate and to be satisfied and to be content because the devil, here's the key, the devil will do his best to make us dissatisfied. 
with no matter what we have. We can drive the finest car, live in the finest home, have the best job, and eat the best food. But the devil will tell you you're not happy, you're not satisfied. So what you got to do, you got to make up your mind, I'm going to be content in whatsoever state I am. I'm going to live with this. I'm going to make it. Amen. Now, I don't know if Brother Smith is watching today or not because it's on Facebook, and I don't know if they've gotten that information yet or not, the streaming but as you know, our brother Prentice Smith had a stroke behind his eye and had the blockage of a, an, uh, a blood vessel there that caused what they think to be permanent loss of vision in his eye. Now, they were hoping that they could get it started again, but they've tried and tried, and so now they're pretty well saying that uh, unless, you know, something happens, God can do it, but it will be a permanent loss of vision in that one eye. I was talking to Brother Cook, his son-in-law, and I was saying, Brother Cook, my, uh, I held my hand over one of my eyes and tried to just use one eye, and it I felt claustrophobic. I I felt, you know, almost frantic, and I said, how's Brother Smith doing? He said, well, his attitude is very good. He's taking it real well. But you know what? There are many conditions and situations where we have to tell ourselves. We have to talk to ourselves. I can get through this. I can make this. I can tolerate this job. I can do my best while I am here. I can do my best where I am living. You know, maybe you're not happy where you are living. I am one to always be looking over the fence and be looking <laughs> somewhere else. And, and I tell my wife I want to move to Arkansas. Well, why Arkansas? Well, I tell her my mother was born there, but that's not, that's not really the reason. I love the mountains and the streams, of especially northwest Arkansas. And then I think how I told her the other day, maybe we ought to move to Arizona with all this humidity and allergy junk, and let's just move to Arizona. Well, we're not going to move anywhere. <laughs> this is it. But nevertheless, there is a restlessness that can get a hold of all of us. And we want to, and I've seen people like that. They're constantly packing up and moving. They're constantly loading a U-Haul or a pickup truck and they're taking off somewhere to another state, to another, hoping that they can find that better place. What about a church? Did you know you're never going to find that perfect church where the pastor pleases you 100% of the time and the people please you 100% of the time? You're going to always be able to look around and say if it was just a little different, if this would happen and this would happen and that would happen. So what you got to do, you ought, you've got to say, thank you, Lord, for my job. Thank you, Lord, for where I live Thank you for my automobile. Thank you for my clothes. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my husband. Thank you for my children. Thank you for the air that I breathe. Thank you for the church that I attend. Thank you, God. And then if God decides to improve the situation, if he decides to change some things, let's learn to be content in whatsoever state. Now, that state there means condition, but it can also apply to the one of the 50 states. We just need to be content. I've dreamed of uh, living in a villa like George Clooney on uh, that lake in, in northern Italy. <laughs> I've seen pictures of that, and oh, mercy, it just seems like a dream world. That lake is so beautiful. And uh, his villa is so lovely, and uh, there, there's staff there, and they keep food. And, oh, I just thought that'd be so neat. But you know what? 
I'm happy at 5923 Sawyer Bend Lane, 77379. Now, I gave that out over the Internet, so they'll probably go rob my house while I'm, while I'm going. <laughs> Except this is going to Facebook, and you can't trust everybody on Facebook. So I better leave here in a little bit and go check things. But we got to be happy. We Maybe not happy. Excuse me. I, maybe I shouldn't have said happy. We need to learn to be satisfied. Well, now, you said satisfied is not being entirely full. No, because we are greedy. We like to stuff. We like to just keep on eating. I mean, when I'm eating beans and cornbread, I was raised on that. I just want another bowl and another bowl. And I like that cornbread and smear some butter on it and some iced tea and just keep going. But you know what? You finally have to stop. And say, I am satisfied. I am. You know what's interesting? Billionaires don't ever say, oh, my, I've got so much money I couldn't spend it if I lived to be a 1,000 years old. I've got so much money I've got to stop. They keep reaching. They keep grabbing. Pratata or whatever his name is, he's thinking about buying the, the rockets and He's already got all these restaurants, and he's got that amusement park, uh, Galveston. He's got so much stuff he doesn't know what to do. He's a billionaire. But you know what? No one is ever satisfied. The devil keeps us miserable. The devil keeps us wanting more and more. So finally, you have to say, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to be satisfied. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to not look at every little gal that comes by with a little short skirt on and wonder why didn't I marry her. But I'm going to be happy with my wife. Amen? Happy with your husband. Happy with your job. Happy with your car. That doesn't mean you can't maybe change cars one of these days. Just don't change husbands and wives. You can change cars and maybe a house, but... But somehow we've got to learn how, as Paul did, I have learned to be content. Sin is the single source of unhappiness. That's why there's unhappiness in the world. It's because of sin. Now, you might say, well, what about people who are living for God? They don't have sin in their life. They repented of their sins. They've been washed in Jesus' name, baptized, gotten their sins remitted, and they're living above sin, a victorious life, and they're still unhappy. Well, this world is not a utopia. It is not a perfect world. 1 Corinthians 13 and 10, look at this. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. In other words, we are not witnessing what is perfect right now. This is an imperfect world. Let's look at Romans 5, 3 through 5, and we'll read from the Message Bible. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. We just need to be thankful and we need to be satisfied. You know, there are folks that complain no matter what happens. 
I tried to recall an old story, and I can't remember it completely, but it seems like this fellow was visiting some people in the home, and, and they asked him uh, how he liked his eggs, and he said, side by side. <laughs> he wanted two eggs. They said, well, how do you want them cooked? He said, well, I would like one scrambled and one fried. And so when he got to the table, he began to complain. They said, what's wrong? He said, well, you fried the wrong one. <laughs> it seems that there are some folks that complain no matter what happens. I heard about a man who was in a church service and sitting by somebody that he didn't really know and there was a lady up singing, and so he leaned over to the fellow next to him. He said, mercy, said, I don't know who that is, but she can't sing. The man said, well, that's my wife. Oh, he said, it's, it's not her, it's the song. <laughs> I've never heard such a bad song. There are some folks that just constantly are unhappy they are constantly complaining. Have you seen some people that just constantly have a frown on their face? They, it's like they're smelling something bad all the time. And, and life is not good to them. But you know what? The devil wants to make every one of us discontented and miserable. Instead, let's make up our minds that we're going to be content. We can decide that. I'm going to be satisfied. I am not going to be a complainer about everything, and I'm not going to be one who's constantly dissatisfied with everything, but I'm going to practice being contented. Contented. See, our world really presses for happiness. 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 I am so thankful that the happiness that can be enjoyed is, is in the Lord. Amen? But you know what? The devil will tantalize you and torment you. He'll say, well, they told me that when I got the Holy Ghost, I would be so happy and just walk on cloud nine and be so wonderful. You know what? The Holy Ghost is wonderful, but you're still going to be frustrated at times. You're still going to be discouraged. You're still going to have those low times. And so what you've got to do is make up your mind. I've got Jesus, and I'm satisfied. I am satisfied. I am satisfied. No, I'm not stuffed and satiated and full, because when I get to the marriage supper of the Lamb, I'm just going to eat everything until I'm full. We will be satisfied when we awake in His likeness, the Bible says. That's when we're going to be really, truly happy so right now we've got to learn we've got to learn to be happy eight years ago or nine when I was in the hospital 10 days in ICU and had open heart surgery I had to really talk to myself here are all these tubes and I used to have been running and doing things and all these tubes and, and all this junk and then you had to lie on your back and I wanted to turn over so badly and you've got to talk to yourself. Well, I perhaps should not mention that personal difficulty because every one of us, we are all adults. We are all old enough to understand and to know that, that such is life. There have been many situations that you've had to just grin and bear it. You've just had to grit your teeth. You've just had to talk to yourself. You've just had to encourage yourself in the Lord. You've had to say, I can do this. I can make it through this. One thing that kept me going I knew that it was going to be a long period of rehabilitation if I lived. And even after two weeks out of the hospital, the doctor said, uh, you're not out of the woods. You could go at any time. And so I thought, well, dear me, how long is this going to take? And, and uh, so 
I began to project. I began to look forward. I began to say, you know, one of these days, I'm going to look back at this. I can't believe it's been, is it eight years? Eight years. I cannot believe it's been that long. Because it seems just almost yesterday that I was in this situation. But you know what? If we'll hang on, if we'll hang on and say, I'm going to make it. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to be satisfied. In fact, I'm satisfied now because, God, you're holding your, my hand and you are with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I saw a far side cartoon many years ago, and I can't remember the gentleman's name that it used, but it showed him coming out of the store, and the name of the store was Happiness. And he was holding a little container, and he said, he said, Mr. It said, Mr. So and so had heard that you could not buy happiness, but he said, but it said he just thought that no one knew where the store was. Well, I'm thankful we know where the store is. Hallelujah. We have bought all the happiness that you can have in the Holy Ghost, but then don't forget, it's not perfect. It's not complete. We don't live in a complete world. One of these days when we get to glory, that's when everything is going to be finished. It's going to be truly complete. The Bible says we are complete in Him. That's true. But we still live in, in an incomplete state. And we are, don't have our glorified bodies yet. So we are not complete. One of these days, everything is going to be completed. I think it's time for our offering. We're going to receive our morning offering. Sunday school offering in Jesus' name. Lord, bless this offering. Bless Brother Shannon No. Thank you, in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes we find ourselves wishing, wishing. And be careful with that. Oh, I wish this, and I wish that. I wish this hadn't happened, and I wish it. I wish. You know, wishes can get us in trouble. In fact, uh, uh, somebody told me, I don't think it's true, that three friends were walking along uh, the beach, and, and uh, they found the bottle and kind of rubbed it a little bit, and out came a genie. <laughs> and um, the genie said, I'm going to grant you three friends, three wishes. And so each one had one wish. So the first guy said, I wish I were in on the beach in Miami, Florida. Well, pow, he was gone. He was on the beach thousands of miles away. The second one said, I wish I were on the beach in why Honolulu and immediately he was gone in there came to the third guy Jeannie said what do you wish he said I wish I had my friends back so <laughs> it messed everything up you know what that's why we can't get our wishes because our wishes would go head on with somebody else's wish and it would conflict and there would be a problem so instead, we've got to learn to be content. Hallelujah. Now, if you will forgive us and if you will be happy and content with this, we're going to ease out of here just a little bit early because our son-in-law and daughter are preaching in Dallas and uh, we've got to go preach for their church over in Humble. And uh, the service starts at 1045 over there. So we're going to wrap it up here and, uh, and uh, leave out of here and drive just five miles over the speed limit, maybe, and get to Humble. So the Lord bless you in whatsoever state I am. Therewith I have learned to be content. Happiness versus contentment. 
So this is just a practical lesson today to try to help us to talk to ourselves and to rebuke the devil that constantly says, you're not satisfied, you're not happy, you're not, and say, get out of here, devil. What it is, the devil is the most unhappy entity in the universe. Folks, he had it made. He was already in heaven, and he got kicked out of heaven. He is forever lost. There's no hope for him whatsoever, but there's hope for all of us. And so let's stand and just love him and thank him. And let's thank Jesus. God, we love you and we thank you. Thank you for that hope that lieth within us. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be more content and to learn contentment and to be satisfied. And our happiness will come one of, the day, one of these days when we get to the city and see you. The Lord bless you. Remember, service resumes at 1045. And uh, you're dismissed for a few minutes in Jesus' name.